Hello. Anybody out there? I know I'm a little early. Just wanted to say hi to everybody that might be on here already. So if you're on here already, just chime on in. Oh, I got Peter. All righty. Just wanted to make sure that everybody was able to get into this one because I'm going through um, a software program. So I didn't want to um, have it not work because <laughs> I hadn't done this one before. But um, you guys are here. Can you hear me? You see me and you hear me. So I see that you guys have come in, but I'm not sure that you can hear me. Let me know if you can hear me. Hello. I want to go back to where I was. Hello. Hello, can you hear me and see me? Okay, good. You can hear and see me. Good. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure, like I said, I, um, I'm i going through StreamYard, which it seems like I have a delay in the audio which I, I regret that. Oh, okay. I sound okay. Good to know because I I wanted to do a little presentation tonight, uh, just a little quick presentation, and I can't and I can't do. I can't do it through YouTube, so I'm trying to do it through. StreamYard, and I'm not sure why I am getting this echo delay on my end. I don't know why that's happening, but since I have all of you here. I got about eight people here. I see Bridget Gaines and Val. And I got Nancy.
he hopped off or not, but I saw my daughter here. Okay, I think I got my video back up and I'm not hearing the delay anymore. Okay, do you still hear the delay? I know I Trisha, you said there's a delay, but it's on my end. There is a delay, but it's on my end. Not on this end. Okay, it was on my end, but I Well, let me go ahead and do this little presentation. Last time we talked, somebody asked about needles and, and, and stabilizers and things like that. And so I decided to do a little short uh, PowerPoint presentation. What I might end up doing is doing the presentation and then switching over to Facebook, I mean, YouTube, because I don't like this echo going back and forth. So I'm going to get started with a little presentation. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Yolene. Okay. So I just put up a slide. If you guys see the slide, let me know. Let me know if you see the slide. Okay. Hi, Andrea. You see the slide. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go through the slide uh, quickly. And like I said, I'll probably switch over to YouTube and, and get out of uh, this live stream because I keep getting this delay on my end, which sounds kind of crazy. So what we're going to talk about quickly is needles, threads, stabilizers, and notion. Okay, I'm glad you see the slide. So I have up here a picture of, like I said, needles, threads, stabilizers, notions like scissors and nippers and and even hoops and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this right quick. The first thing is needles, and I hope you guys can read this. And I just listed all the different types of needles. Uh, first one. The first one I have is universal needles, which most of us use. And it states that it's an all-purpose needle. It has a standard eye and slightly rounded on the points and suitable for woven knits and synthetics and the recommended size. And that's what I wanted to point out. It goes as uh, low as uh, eight, eight over 60, all the way up to 10 over 120. 
And the most common one is a 7511 sharp or a ballpoint. And uh, a tip tip to remember, the smaller the number means it's an extra light up to a larger number, which is an uh, extra heavy. So if someone tells you 16100, then that's something for something that's uh, very heavy. But if you have a, a, 80 by, a 8 by 60 or or a 1070, anything like that, that would be considered for lighter garments or either lighter thread. A regular sharp is very thin shaft and slim point, good for most wovens, including heirloom fabrics, silk, microfibers, and it ranges from 860 to 16100. And then you have your ballpoint, which ranges the same, but it is basically the needle that passes between the fibers without snagging, and it's good for knits and um, things like that, t-shirts and stuff like that. And of course, you have your jean, uh, your jean needle, which is a very strong needle and designed for tightly woven fabrics such as denim and canvas. And it also ranges as low as 860 and as high as 19120. I've never used one larger than a nine. Let me see. The largest one I've used has been a 16100. You have your leather needle, needle for leather, and it is um, has a good cutting point for real leather, leather and some vinyls, but you have to be careful because it will leave holes in the stitching. So if you remove something, if you make a mistake and you take it apart, you're going to have holes in there. So you have to be very careful when you're using leather or vinyl. And it ranges from an 860 to a 1920. And you have your stretch, your needle for stretch, stretchy clothes, like elastic fabric, swimwear, lycra, or spandex. And the lowest one for this one is a 12 by 80, all the way up to 18, 110. I've never used a stretch needle. And then there are other specialty needles. Um, we've all seen the ones that just simply say embroidery and metallic needles which is very delicate but it prevents the break of the of the uh, of the uh, metallic thread you have your quilting needle which um stitches through multiple layers really well and i've never seen a spring needle but uh, that's the free motion stitching 
And then you have your top stitch needle, which I've seen, and it's good for heavy threads, like if you're top stitching over jeans or denim, and a twin or triple, which is two or two, two needles or three needles on a single shank for decorative work. I have a twin needle, but I've never used it. And wing needle, which is for decorative, and it creates large holes in woven. I have a wing needle, but I've never used it either. Hi, Mary. Okay, the next one is threads, and the higher the number of the thread means the finer the thread is. So if you have a 40 weight, which is what we commonly use, then that's a heavier thread than a 60 weight, which would be a much thinner thread. So the higher the number means the finer the thread. And for best result, use the special needles designed for your special thread. And I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to let it stay up for a little while so you can read it yourself and you'll see the different kinds of threads that they have. I want to point out two, three, three threads that I've, I've never used a nylon thread. I've seen the transparent, never used it. And rayon, I was told that it's best for freestanding lace. It's shiny. I have some. I haven't used it yet. And the multicolor thread, which is actually variegated thread, those are um, good as well. I'm glad you caught me too, Mary. I hope you're hearing this well. So the next one is stabilizer. And I know someone asked about stabilizers, I believe, in, in the last, last live. So um, what is considered a good stabilizer stock. Now I did my research and this is what was listed. And it says a basic stock of a few different types of stable stabilizers covers most needs and you need to build up your stock. Now I have a uh, tear away, but I don't have all three weights. I only have the medium, a uh, uh, good quality tear, uh, sticky tear away, fusible tear away. I don't have uh, medium cut away. I have poly mesh cut away and iron on fusible poly mesh cut, uh, cut away and water soluble fabric such as violin, which is good for uh, freestanding lace, and then a thin water soluble film, um, which is good for your topping, and um, a good quality sticky back stabilizer, which I don't have. Thank you. Thank you, Crafty. 
Choosing a stabilizer is not an exact science. And we talked about that. You know, some of us have all of it. Some of us have some of it. I have some of it. And I kind of go by what I think works best. And it's most mostly a trial and error when it comes down to stabilizer. But if you try to follow up what the experts say, usually your project is going to come out okay. But it's usually going to be trial and error. Now, the notions, we all know what they are. And so we'll just go through this quickly. Scissors, thread stands, cutting mat, marking pins, rulers, tweezers, hoops and grids, magnetic hoops and adhesive spray and masking tapes. Those are usually the common uh, notions that we have in our embroidery uh, toolbox. So this is the end of it. So as I was saying, there's no right or wrong choices to be made when trying to select the best embroidery needles, threads, and stabilizers, etc. And for me, I believe the best way to be sure to be successful is to follow the proven suggestions and recommendations made by known experts in the field. And I try to follow the industry's proven standards. For me, I, I pretty much go by what John Deere says, and it's a few other sites that I follow and kind of go by what they say, but most of it is what I've tried, what works and what doesn't work, and then I try to learn from my mistakes. So that's the end of my, my uh, slide presentation. So I hope, hopefully this was um, informative and something that you got a little bit out of, so now we can just kind of have some free flow conversations. I, I'm going to switch over. Hopefully I don't lose you guys, but I'm going to switch over to YouTube because I keep getting this feedback and I don't know why I get the feedback on my end. It sounds delay and, and that kind of throws me off with my conversation. So I'm going to switch over and hopefully I don't lose you guys and uh, I'll see you another year. Okay, I'm over here in um, on YouTube. Can you guys hear and see me? Okay, good. Um, I don't know if that, that didn't fix the feedback. I have no idea what that is. I don't know. It, it, it's very um, annoying on my end. I don't know if you guys are getting it, but it's very annoying on my end.
A pipe cleaner is great too. I fold it in half and use it to take the lit dust and thread from the bobbin area and under the needle pack. Oh, that's a good idea. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I I don't know why I'm having this this um Yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad that you guys aren't having the same issue I'm having on my end. So I'm just going to tolerate it because I'm glad you guys are here. And I'm glad that you aren't hearing all of this feedback and stuff. And I'm glad to hear that it's okay on your end, Crafty. So it is really annoying on my end. So I don't know what it is. It, it's just me repeating the words back to myself. I'll say it and then I'll hear it again. So that's what's going on over here in my neck of the woods. <laughs> so I, I I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I really don't know what it is. It's, it's just really weird. Mute my laptop. Mute my laptop. Okay, let me see if that works. I hope that works. Maybe that was what it was because I don't think I hear it anymore. Okay, thanks for that. That who told me that? That was Jola Bean. Okay. How come you didn't tell me that 30 minutes ago? Now I know what to do going forward because I know that was driving me crazy. It's like, why am I hearing this echo and this double stuff here? So usually the echo feedback is because you have some speaker volume turned on. Okay, because I just turned off my phone. I said, what is it? My phone, what is it? So I learned something. So going forward, because everything else seemed to be working, it just was I kept getting this, this, this feedback constantly. And it was working my nerves. I was like, this is not going to be a good <laughs> This is not going to be a good thing. But thank you for that. Because that, that worked for me. And I'm so glad you guys didn't hear that on your end. Because it was horrible. <laughs> it's like hearing, hearing yourself talk. And then hearing yourself talk again. When you're doing something different. That's exactly the way it was sounding. So I was talking over myself because I didn't want to have all these dead spots. But I'm glad I learned that because I am not that technically inclined. I try to figure things out on my own. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I hadn't done this one before. So now I know what to do going forward. And um, I wanted to try this uh, streaming software because it allows it allowed me to share my screen where I was able to put that uh, that presentation up because I wanted to give you guys the information that I had found. You know, I didn't want to be teachy or preachy, but we had talked about especially stabilizing. Some people had asked me about needles, and I know they can be confusing sometimes because I don't know about you guys, but I try to use the needle specifically for the fabric that I'm using. 
if I'm use if I'm doing some vinyl or leather type stitching, I will use a leather uh, needle. If I'm doing metallic thread, I use metallic needle. Um, the sharp and the ballpoint, I kind of get confused as to when to use it and when not to use it. So those are inter interchanged unless um, I get instructions. If I'm doing a project and they instruct me to use a particular needle, then I'll do that. So those are the two needles I kind of get, you know, confused about when and where and how to use it. But when it comes down to the specialty needles, I do try to follow that. And um, so far I've had had results from that because I think we spoke the other other night about um, metallic thread and King Star being a really good thread. And I do use my metallic needle when I'm using that thread and that thread does not break. And I've had, I've used other metallic thread and it would break and break and break. I would turn the, the, the speed down as low as it would go. And when I was on my um, single needle machine, I put it on a separate uh, thread stand and brought it all the way up and around trying to keep it from getting kinked up. And I still would have the thread breakage. But once I switched the brand of my metallic thread, it seemed to work out pretty good. But again, like I said, I do try to use the specialty needles. Um, back to your your uh, your statement you made, Yola Bean, about uh, using a pipe cleaner, which is a Chanel stick, and you fold it in half and use it to take the lint and dust and thread from the bobbin. Uh, area and uh, oh okay so that's what you use to clean out under there okay because I have a little bitty thin brush that that can go a little bit under there but I usually end up just taking it off and uh, cleaning it out brushing it off real good and putting it back because you will get those wiper and timer errors if you don't take care of that and clean it off and I know um I don't think Bill Nicholson is on here tonight, but he put a message in um, the live. I think I did last week. He he watched it afterwards, and he put a message in saying that he um, cleaned out the thread tray underneath the needles, and he said it's attached by two screws. I'm not touching that, and I really don't need to because I just had my machine made. Uh, the maintenance done, and I'm sure they cleaned all that out. But he, you know, you know how guys are. He said he did, and it worked fine for him, and he cleaned it out real good. So I just thought I'd, I'd pass that little tidbit out in case somebody is brave and want to try that. I'm not the one. <laughs> I'm not taking anything or lose. I don't have to. So, Trisha, you asked about anyone find an iron on tearaway that doesn't leave a residue when you peel off the excess, iron on tearaway. I don't know if I've used an iron on tearaway before. So if anybody has, then let me know. Uh, put it in the comments. And um, so we can answer that question because I have not used it. So I'm not familiar with the iron on uh, tear away. I use the sticky back, but not the one that you iron on. Okay. So, um, one other thing that I, I wanted to show that I've gotten for dime, and it is the embroiderer's compass. I bought this back when I kind of first started embroidering. And I don't know if anybody else is familiar with it, but what it does, it's a little wheel that can help you pick out the type of thread and stabilize and needle that you need, depending upon what type of, uh, what garment, what what uh, the fabric is that you're using. Hi, Diane. How are you? Thanks for stopping by. 
like this one, it says, um, let me see what, what I use. Okay, lace and freestanding uh, stabilizer. They suggest a wash, a, a sew and wash mesh stabilizer. And they are suggesting a light ballpoint um, a 7010. You can use a extra slim ballpoint, which is a universal 7511. And then it says, as far as hooping, hoop securely and remove with water. Now you can spin it around. You, you spin it around to the fabric that you want. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a circle that you can spin around based upon what you want. And then it will tell you as if you go through it, what, what it is, because this one is capped. Stabilizer for caps, heavy weight or extra heavy weight cap backing, which I have. And it says frame the cap with the backing, support the crown of the cap, reduce, which reduces shifting and adds crispness and regulate the bobbin tension. It didn't tell you to move the, the sweatband, but you got to move that sweatband as well. And it says that you can use an extra slim ballpoint universal 7511 or a sharp point 8012 or you can use um, 8513 point depending upon the type of fabric of the cap. But this is something that, like I said, is a useful tool. But I know those of us that have the Brother PR 1055, 1050, I don't know, but um, I think it has in there where you can uh, get the recommendation for what to use. I know in, in brilliance, because I think I was having a brain fart, I think it is on the machine, but I don't want to swear to that right now because because the brain fart is still there. But I know for a fact it is an brilliant software where you can definitely um, go up in, there's an icon that, that tells you what you need to use as far as stabilizer and thread and needle for that particular fabric for the project that you're doing. So if you're, uh, you know, you have those kinds of helpmates for you if you have any questions. But this is this is a good thing. Now you can get it from Dime. They have them on sale occasionally. If they're not on sale, I think they run twenty five dollars. If they're on sale, they're nineteen ninety nine, and you can get them from um, Amazon. And uh, I think they're nineteen ninety nine on Amazon whenever they have them. They run out sometimes. But if it's something that you're interested in, that is also something that can be of help if you're trying to decide how to, um, you know, match up your fabric with your needle, with your stabilizers and stuff like that. But I know most of us have been doing it at least a couple of years. And I think we probably have figured out our own little way of, of doing things that work for us. But it's never, you know, you can always learn. And sometimes you forget. And if you haven't done something for a while, you might need a little reminder. And so uh, that's a good tool. Your software can be a good tool and it might even be located in your, in your machine uh, to give you some kind of idea as to um, what to select. So hopefully that information has uh, been helpful. Now, as I was doing my research and I was looking at the information about hoops, and since I use Mighty Hoops 99% of the time, I've not used a hooping grid in at least a year, at least a year, I'm pretty sure. And I know that um, those of us that still use, well, I won't even say us because I haven't used my single needle machine in over a year too. 
<laughs> it's been a while. She's sitting over there being so sad because I won't use her. But I've just gotten so used to using my 10 needle machine. I, I try to do everything I can with it because it's quick and simple. And I don't like changing the thread if I don't have to. I, I do enjoy the fact that I have those multi uh, needles up there in those different color threads. So, but if you're using your um, a single needle machine and you're hooping, I think most of those uh, hoops come with grids. And do you guys still use your grids for your measurement? Are you still doing what we were taught to do at the very beginning? I know I was looking at, I think that was, um, I think that was you Crafty, that I saw a video where you were doing, um, I don't remember what you were making, but you pulled your grid out and you were using it and I got embarrassed. <laughs> I haven't used my grid and I don't know how long. I don't even know if I remember how to use it. <laughs> and I saw that and I said, oh my goodness, I should get back to doing that. <laughs> so um, TR, you say you still use your grid? Good. And um, Diane, hi. Glad you could join in. I think I've spoken to everybody. Marissa, did I say hi to you? Um if not, hi, welcome. I know I said hi to Mary, hi to the crappy Yola Bean. Leslie, I don't think I said hi to you. How you doing? Thanks for stopping in. Marissa, hi. Uh, Trisha, I spoke to you. Mary, Leslie, who else? Who else? Who else? I said hi to Andrea. Stop. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, Nancy, Trisha, Christine, Bridget. And Val, if Val is still here. And I think that that's that's it that I've I've um been able to to see your name and stuff. There may be other people looking that uh haven't um commented or anything. I I, I realize that there there are people that actually watch the live, and if you don't comment, which I didn't think about that then I don't know that you're there. So people are there and I don't know. But anyway, hi to any and everybody that is watching this live that has not made a comment or introduced themselves. I do appreciate the fact that you tune in and that you're watching. And I hope that you will get something out of, uh, out of this broadcast. And we do this every Tuesday night and we try to answer questions and, and, and ask questions and, help each other out and things like that. Everybody responds to other people's questions and stuff if you know the answers. So that's what we do here. So Crafty, you do use the grid. Yes, I saw you and I, you use your single needle on your video uh, because most people have a single needle machine. That is true. And yeah, I saw your your um, video you just did with you uh, put the uh, names on the sleeves. And I, like I said, I haven't used my single needle machine in a long time. I know people don't, a lot of people don't have multi-needle machines. And um, I should be more cognizant of that, get back to using my single needle machine. I might have to teach myself how to use it again. Because <laughs> I have not done it. I, I really enjoy my 10 needle machine. Yeah. That you love your your multi needle machine. I do. I love my multi needle machine, and that's my comfort level now because that's what I use most of the time. I don't care how small the project is. I try to do it on my on my on my ten needle machine because it's just simple to me. It's just simple. It saves time. You put those threads in there. That's the main thing for me to be able to go ahead and assign the colors and forget about it. I don't have to take the thread out, stop it and pin it, pin the stuff down and all of the stuff that, that I used to do. And, um, but um, like I said, I, I got embarrassed when I watched yours and I said, I don't do that anymore. I need to do it. I haven't used the grid. I still have my grids, but I have not used my grids to measure anything. I do measure. Now, that I do. I do measure. I have several rulers. I have the big long rulers and I put the little handles on there with the 
instructions and stuff and and, and all of that. So I do do my my measurements and stuff and marking and things like that to try to make sure that I get everything uh, centered. But as far as me uh, the greens, I've not done that. And Kristen Smith, you just per purchased your first multimedia machine. You bought the um, how do you pronounce that? Is that Bay of Ba? I know it's Japanese. 1501. And uh, I'm thinking this is a 15 needle machine. I've heard good things about them, and I also heard that they're priced pretty good. My only question is did they tell you or recommend to you how and where you can get um, tech support if needed? That has been the only concern. Bye. Okay, it's like bye. Okay. All right, so that's how you pronounce it, bye. Because I've seen, like I said, I, I've seen that machine. I've looked at the advertisement and stuff like that. And um, I know, like, I've heard good things about it. So congratulations. Hopefully you will um, enjoy it wonderfully. And let us know how it's working for you. Have you had a chance to set it up and stitch anything on it to see how it works? Are you happy with the results of everything? Because I know you are excited. If you're like me, uh, I'm like a kid in the candy store. When I get something new like that, I just want to jump right in there and start. Uh, supposedly, they have very good customer service. Yeah. Well, that part is good. I guess what I was thinking about, if you need a repair of some kind, so that has always been my concern with some of these other machines. Um, I know the red line, if I'm correct, because I've never had a red line, so I'm just going by, uh, oh, it hasn't come yet. Okay, okay. Well, let us know how things turn out when, when you get it. I know you're excited. Um, when I was watching Eve a lot, she used to say, I know she bought the red line, and she always uh, recommended the red line because it's very economical. But the one thing that had that stood out the most with me with her talking about the red line was that she had to do all of the maintenance and stuff herself. Now, for her, she didn't mind. She said she liked it. She grew up with a grandfather that he let her tinker around with tools and stuff. So all of that stuff was common. You know, it was comfortable for her. And that's not my comfort level. I, I had an issue where I had a machine where I had to literally take it apart and dig in it and screw this and screw that and move things around. And I had to tell the technician, look, I'm too old to to change my profession to mechanic. I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> That's not what I want to be at my age, just being a mechanic. I don't want to have to take stuff apart, screw this on, screw that off, and take this. I don't want to do that. I don't want that, that stress on me. And so having a brother machine, even though it can be an issue if you don't have a brother dealer anywhere near you, but, you know, at least, you know, there's a place that you can physically take it to or if you're blessed and find somebody that can actually come into your home, which would be idea. OK, you say you're very excited and you will let us know uh, how well it works and you have to maintain the machine. But customer service will walk you through the process. OK, yeah, I've heard. Yeah, because I know if I'm not mistaken, I think Pacoma does that, too. I think that's what the red line does. Um, who's somebody else I talked to that had a different machine? And I can't remember. I think that's what they had to do. I wanted a brother, but the cost was well beyond my But yeah, Oh, yeah. Because I understand the buy is a lot cheaper. I understand that. That's what I've, I've heard. You get a whole 15-needle machine for two, uh, two, two brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can have twins <laughs> compared to what a what a what a brother costs. But what I have learned, and it's unfortunate, the price of brothers and and baby locks 
are dependent upon the dealer, uh, the location, you know, like statewide and so forth, because I've heard prices that were far above the price that I paid. And that was unfortunate because they should be the same. If whatever whatever that price is should be that price. It shouldn't be if I buy it from Joe in California, it's gonna cost this much. And if I buy it from Bill in in Alabama, it costs this much. And if I go to New York, you know, so forth and so on. It shouldn't be that way. It should be the same price everywhere you go, regardless of where you are. It's the same machine. So why the price is different? But I do understand that that unfortunately is the case. And that's one of the reasons why they don't advertise their prices. They won't let you know their their prices until you physically walk into the store and act like you can buy it. And then they'll tell you how much they're going to sell it to you for. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I did pay a nice amount of money, but I did not pay what I've heard that they have been sold for in other places. And um, that, that's unfortunate. But yeah, hopefully the the, um, the buy will be very satisfactory because I've heard good things about them. I really have. I've heard good things about them. So um, let's see, what else can we talk about tonight? One thing that I, I, I wanted to ask you guys, I know uh, most of all of you go to people's different lives and they're, they're, um, they, have, they have cute little names. I don't have a name for mine. <laughs> I was wondering, what should I name my live? And um, anybody got any, any suggestions or anything? Chris said, I like brothers a lot, but $12,000 for a six feet of Oh my goodness. Yes, indeed, it is. I, yeah, you're right. Uh uh. Not for a six needle. No. And see, that's, that's not right. I know that Eve told us, and I keep saying Eve because that's what I used to watch religiously. And so I have a lot of uh, Eve stories, I guess. But I know when uh, when she was talking about her six needles, because I think she bought her first multi needle, I believe was a six needle brother, if I'm correct, or eight needle. Do they have an eight needle? It was whatever that needle is before you get to the ten. I think it was a six needle, and she did say she, if I'm not mistaken, I think she said she paid eight grand for it. Now, mind you, that's been several years ago, but that's still a lot of money. And I think she said the red line cost her around that amount of money. So she did get a much better deal going to the red line for basically the same price that she got her her little brother. But yeah, that that's too much. And if they're selling the Six needles for twelve. What in the world are they trying to sell a two needle? That's that's too much. Yeah, that's that's not for a ten, not for a six needle. And I've seen different prices on the six needles. I've seen them less than twelve. I have. I, well, I won't say I've seen them. I've seen people say they were less than twelve. They talked about it and said they were less than twelve, where they had priced them and so forth. So it depends upon where you are and who you can buy it for. Uh, buy it for which is what I don't like. Um, and like I had said, oh, who was that, that? I don't know if she's on here because I can't remember who she was that asked about the mail code and wanted to get a mail code. And if you're on here, did you check with the rep that Jasmine, uh, Angela Jasmine uses and did they give you a good quote? 
I'm just curious if you're on here because I can't remember who that person was. See? LPLP Pocono sewing back 898 uh 8995 for the six needs. That's what I'm trying to say. You go from nine to twelve. That's that's three thousand dollars that you can save just by going to a different place. That that's that's what bothers me. I have to be honest about it. I love brother. I don't have anything bad to say about a brother machine. I just don't like the way they sell them. Okay, mail codes are expensive. Um, the last time I checked on a mail code a couple of years ago, I want to say that they quoted me 16. And that was with Jasmine's discount, I think. I can't swear that that was the price, but that's what I kind of remember because I was considering it. And I think that's what they said. And the mail code is a 16 needle. I, if I was to ever get another multi-needle machine, if I didn't get a brother, it would be a mail code. That, that's where my head, because I like the way it works. They're still 16. Okay. All right. That's what I thought. That's what I thought, which is still expensive. But if you compare what you get, I think it's worth it because brothers trying to sell their 10 needles way more than 16. <laughs> In some places, they are trying to sell them for way more than 16. It doesn't work with the MacBook. Okay. I don't have a Mac. But d doesn't it come with its own laptop? I think it does. I think the mail code comes with its own laptop. I'm not sure. But I think that's what Jasmine said. Um, Jasmine. Angela Jasmine. I think that's what she said. But I know you need to have a computer, a laptop computer to use it. That was one of my um, one of one of the selling points, not anywhere near the main one, but it was one of the selling points was the fact that of the tech uh, support that you could get via the computer, where they can actually analyze your machine and find out what's wrong with it, and may even be able to correct it via the computer. And I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and that that was one of the selling points for for the uh, Melco for me. Okay, no, you can use one you have or purchase it separately. Oh, okay, so you, it does not give you a laptop. Okay. And TR, uh, what did you say? You love the ease of use with your baby. Now, when you say your baby lock, are you talking about a multi-needle baby lock? Because they're even more expensive than the brothers. They're pretty much the same. They don't, it's not a whole lot of difference between the baby lock 10 needle and the brother 10 needle. They're almost neck to neck except for in price from what I from what I've seen. But um I love my brother, so I would love a baby lock. And I know I've looked at a baby lock Solaris, their single needle machine, which is synonymous to the brothers Luminaire. And they both are spectacular single needle machines that I would love to own because I know that they can do some really, really good stuff. And they have that huge frame, frame, hoop, which is what I like, a big hoop. And, um, yeah, it would be nice. Kristen, I like my baby lock because it has just enough bells and whistles to make me happy. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with my alliance. Solaris costs a whole lot of money. <laughs> T 
Tia, yes, I feel like they try to make baby locks a more luxury household. They, they do. They even try to sell it, upsell it over a brother, like brother's the stepbrother. But they do the same thing. Brother has my design center and baby lock has the IQ center. And they are almost exactly alike. They may have different names, but they do the exact same thing. Because you, I've looked at someone do a tutorial using a baby lock IQ, and I could follow along with that. And she even mentioned it when she brought it up. I could follow along with her tutorial with my uh, brother because they're the same with my design. You go into my design and my design looks almost just like the IQ. And IQ is baby lock, my design is brother. So they do the same thing. They just want you to think that the baby lock is better. Um, I got my destiny too when the Solaris came out. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I'm just sticking to my SP1900. <laughs> when I bought it, I thought it did a whole lot too. It, it does. I mean, it serves its purpose. It does what it's supposed to do. And I mean, but you know, if you look at if you look at a Solaris or you look at a Luminaire, you you're gonna definitely say, "Wow!" I looked at before I realized what embroidery machines cost because I I had no clue none because i hadn't bought one i hadn't even had a sewing machine in decades so i had no idea what the cost of these machines were and i was considering getting an embroidery machine just popped in my head that that's what i wanted to do and there was a sewing back on my way to and fro from work and i decided to stop in one afternoon and i went in and they had the Stellar, the Brother Stellar in there. And they had, you know, how they stitch out all these wonderful designs and samples and everything. And they had the hoop and everything. And I, and then they had the brochure. And I looked at that brochure and I looked at that machine and I looked at all of the beautiful stitching and I just fell head over heel in love with that until that man told me how much it cost. <laughs> I was like, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> you have got to be kidding because I it was right at $8,000. I had no idea machines cost that much. None. I was just floored. I, I I had to start doing my research then, and then I learned quickly that if I wanted a, a good, I won't say good because the SC1, SC1900 is a good machine, but if you want one that does the fancy dancy stuff, you're going to have to spend some fancy dancy money, and yeah, I was like, wow, my dreams are big. <laughs> But then I, I decided to go big and, and, and get the 10 needle. Luminaire is the first embroidery machine I ever seen, and I thought it was a mutant sewing machine. <laughs> oh, how, how much are you asking? How much of what, LP? It was so gorgeous sitting there. It was. I mean, the Luminaire, I almost bought the Luminaire over my 10 needle machine. I was head over heels in love with that luminaire because even when I went to the dealer to get the 10 needle machine, when I left home, that was my mindset, 10 needle brother machine. And I got in there and looked at that luminaire and I had to think twice. Do I want the luminaire or do I want the 10 needle? Do I want the luminaire or 10 needle? I was head over heels in love with that luminaire and I still am. I want the luminaire when I grow up. <laughs> Are the Solaris. Either one of them works fine for me, but those are some, and I haven't even seen the, the upgraded one, the Luminaire 3. And um, But you know, there's another machine, and I don't know if anybody uses Janome, but there was a Janome machine that came out 
last year, mid last year, or close towards the end of the year, that um, reminded me of a luminaire. That machine did everything but pay the bill. I was like, OMG, they're going to give Luminaire and Solaris a run for his money. Have anybody seen or heard anything about that machine? I can't remember. <clears throat> it was a name, Lum it was a the Janome 17, something other, something other. I don't remember because I even got in contact with a, um, with a, um, a, so a, a sewing center. I was just being curious. I want to know what it costs. I wasn't going to buy it. <laughs> and they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> but I was like, this puppy here got to be expensive because it was right up there with the Luminaire and the, um, the Solaris. And, and it was a, it is a genomic machine. And when I saw all of the bells and whistles and things that it did, it was, it was a lot. The Continental M17. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yep. Have you have you um, followed up on that or anything? Did you think anything about it? Because I thought that it did a lot of stuff. Yeah. So. Okay, you have the brother NQ 16E and your sister has the florist too. Yeah, many dished the destiny to buy the Solaris. I remember seeing on YouTube a couple of years ago where the guy was promoting the destiny. And if you bought the destiny, you got the case, the rolling case, and and a whole lot of other stuff along with it. And of course, they didn't tell you what it was on this video thing, because I guess you had to be physically there. They were doing all the advertising and talking and all that stuff where you could see, but when it came down to the nitty gritty, how much does it cost situation, they weren't putting that up there, but they were pushing that destiny pretty hard. I guess that was before the Solaris or either the Solaris had just come out and they were trying to get rid of the destinies quickly before because I, I yeah they tend to do that okay what state is everyone from and LP is from New Jersey Crafty I know you're in Maryland TR you in Louisiana uh, okay Leon White wow Hi, how are you? You're from Houston, Texas. Hey, Leslie, you're from Virginia. And Val from Pennsylvania. I'm in Maryland. I'm from everywhere. <laughs> if you tell me you've been somewhere, I can tell you I probably live. <laughs> oh, Christian, you're from Ohio. Okay. Yeah. So some are everywhere. And Andrea, you from Maryland. Mary, you from Tennessee. Texas. Tennessee. Uh, I think. Didn't they didn't you guys get hit down there? Hope it wasn't anywhere near you with the with the tornado from last week, because I know it it hit some parts of Memphis and it hit some part of Tennessee. I'm not quite sure when it went through Mississippi. Because I have relatives and friends, and because I, I, like I said, I've been everywhere. I lived in Mississippi for 16 years. So that's, that's part of my home as well. I moved down there when I was a little girl and went to high school and college down there. My mother passed away when I was a little girl and moved down there with my grandparents. And so I, uh, I lived in Mississippi. But I know the South. <laughs> I know the South. It was close. We we are near Mississippi. Okay, yeah, because I had to check on check on my friends and relatives down there. Um, but it hit Rolling Fork, which was below my hometown and above Jackson, where my girlfriend lived. So they were sandwiched in the middle, and Rolling Fork was in the middle, and it just wiped that off the map. And Silver City too, I think, is what it was. Cause I mean, it was it was devastated, and when I saw that, I was like, Lord, let me check on my folks, see if they still standing. 
when I lived down there as a kid, those tornadoes used to come through there and people lived in these little raggedy houses with tin roofs and they would come through there and it would scare me. That is one thing that I was petrified of even through adulthood of a tornado because they would whip through there and you had no cover, no cover. All you could do, <laughs> all you could do is tumble down and pray. I remember one came through. I grabbed my three babies because they were babies then. I grabbed my three babies and just held on to them and prayed. Lord, that's all I could do. Just grab the babies and hold on to them and just pray when that wind went through. And and you could just hear it whipping so loud. So I I can imagine it was it was rough down there and it just devastated rolling fork. It just turned everything into toothpicks. And those poor people down there didn't have much anyway. And it just just took it apart. That is so sad. And now it's trying to come up further north. I was just talking to my my best friend that, that lives in Kansas City just before I came on. And she was telling me about the forecast. I, I had seen that this morning where it's supposed to run through uh, Kansas City and St. Louis, which again, my homes, I was born in St. Louis and I lived in Kansas City for a while. So it's going to whip through there. I just pray everything just turns out okay. And I think it's supposed to head up there to uh, Iowa, Kristen. I think that's what I saw. So I'm praying that everybody stays safe. Yeah, stay safe. And poor Leon, you're down there in Houston where they have all them doggone hurricanes flooding and carrying on. When I was in Florida, that was another thing that I was concerned about. You get to the point there's nowhere you can live where it's, the climate is just ridiculous. Where can you live without worrying about some kind of disaster happening? You know, whatever. LP, has anyone used embroidery thread from thread art? Any thoughts on the quality? I have not. I've heard of them, but I've never used their thread. So if anybody has used it for, can you chime in and let um, LP know what you think? Because I'm not familiar with the usage of thread art. I've only used uh, Metro EMB. I've used, uh, of course, Madeira and Floriani. Sulky, I've used, I uh, have some of that. And I bought that SIM thread from Amazon and I still have the whole case that I bought because my, my my little machine, my uh, SE 1900 did not like that, that thread at all. It just would not, it broke and broke. It's beautiful thread, I mean, beautiful colors. I loved it. I looked at it and said, oh, this is so pretty. But it just, it just didn't work. I made it work though, the best I could because that's all I had at the time and I used it, you know, when I was learning how to use the machine and everything. But when it came down to actually starting to make things to try to sell or whatever, I I didn't use it. I didn't use it. So um, I am not familiar with thread art. Okay, I'm looking at a, a conversation. Are you talking about the Continental M M17 that you looked it up and you was trying to find out how much it costs and you can't find the price online? Is that what you're asking, Christine? I don't think that the price is online because I tried to find it myself. And machines like that, they they don't advertise the prices. Uh, I don't know the, the exact 100% reason why they don't. I think part of it is that they intend to sell it for whatever they can get for it. And I think the other um, reason is um, they don't want competitors to know what they're selling it for. 
And Crafty, you said that your multi-needle loves Madeira. I don't use, I like Madeira thread. Madeira has good thread. But like I mentioned before, I don't buy a lot of Madeira stuff because I don't like the way they ship. I don't like the fact that they don't tell you your final price prior to you giving them your credit card and saying, yes, I'm going to buy it because I like to know exactly how much my bill is. I don't want to get a surprise at the end. I bought $50 worth of stuff and I'm paying $75 for it because you charge me $25 shipping. I, I don't like that. I like to know up front, give me the opportunity to say yes or no on your shipping fee. And they don't do that. Because I know you can buy Madeira threads at other places that the shipping could be cheaper. Because I bought Madeira thread, if I'm not mistaken, elsewhere. I think I, I know Dimes sells Madeira thread and some of like Ken sewing, sewing back and maybe even all, all stitch and all brand. I'm not really sure about all brand, but I think all stitch does as well. So there's other places that you can buy Madeira thread and not have to worry about that crazy shipping policy that they have. But if you do want to buy from them, you get your some all stitch. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's what I would do because Madeira, I don't think they they do it well. But yeah, I knew that you could buy the um, Madeira elsewhere without having to go through Madeira directly. And um, not have to work because I don't think all stitch shipping is that bad price wise because I use all stitch and all brand quite a bit. So I think that they they're pretty reasonable with their shipping, but Madeira is not. Their shipping is ridiculous. But if you do it on the weekend, they will give you a, uh, they will do you a, a discount. Don't get it directly from from Madeira. Correct. Don't get it. To, don't don't tell them I said. Had <laughs> him sending me a nasty note. <laughs> but if you want to save a little change, I would not go directly to Madeira. I would go elsewhere because I I think that you can save a little money if you don't go directly. Um, to Madeira and go elsewhere because there are other places that do sell Madeira thread. And the thread itself is not expensive. It's just, you know, it's it's comparable to the other threads. It's just the um the way they the way they handle their business. Um I'm trying to think. Oh nobody came up with a name for for, for my life. Okay, Tricia, you say you use all kinds of thread. Everything works well in my single needle and your multi-needle machine. If you use metallic, buy from Dime. I cannot tell you how much junk I've gotten over the years. Yeah, uh, Dime does say, and, and I can't think, I bought my, um, I, and Dime sells Kingstar metallic, if I'm not mistaken, but I bought my Kingstar metallic somewhere else. I want to say Ken sewing back, I think. Not one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just saw the price of uh, <laughs> Andrea. How do you find the price? <laughs> Andrea Ross found the price of the con of the Janome Continental M17. <laughs> And she says it's listed for $19,999. Yeah, that's about right. Because I told you that it's comparable to the Luminaire and the, and the um, Solaris. When I saw them, when I saw them do their presentation, because I saw the presentation of that machine last year, and then I looked it up and I read all the goodies and stuff because I started salivating when I saw it. And it does this and does that. And I said, oh, it's going to give Luminaire and Solaris a run for his money. And I knew then that it was going to be expensive. 
<laughs> but that's just a joke. When I see those kind of prices, they're like for a single needle machine, come on now. But that's, you know, they want that kind of money for the Solaris and the Luminaire. If, you, if, if you're willing to pay that kind of money, I wouldn't. They would have to definitely figure out how, how to get that price down for me. Before I buy it, I would not give them $20,000 for a single needle machine. That's not happening. Not happening. Yeah. Okay, Tricia, you got your King Star from Sewing Machine Plus. That may have been where I got mine from. I'm not sure. I know it was one of the places. That's about the price of the Luminaire 3 or more. Okay, I know it is. Oh, you went to the to the Janome website and they had the price up. Oh, that's that's interesting. It's the same as the Stellar XE1. Are you saying the price is the same? The Janome and the I'm talking to Andrea. Are you saying that the price for the Stellar XE1 is the same price as the uh, Janome M17. They went up. Yep. All righty then. So if the Stellar costs that much, well, how much is the Luminaire and the Baby, the, uh, Solar, the, the Solaris? Because the Luminaire has to cost more than the Stellar. And I know that the uh, the Luminaire 3 probably is higher than the Luminaire 2. I only priced the Luminaire 2 during the same time frame that I was getting my, my uh, PR1055X. And the, the dealer told me they were equal in price. That's why I was trying, I was having this, this, this struggle. Get the Luminaire, get the Ten needle, get the luminaire, get the ten needle, and even the dealer said, "Get the ten needle," which is what my heart was telling me in the first place, because that's what I went there for. But every time I see the luminaire, I salivate. So, <laughs> yeah, but they—they're getting ridiculous. The same, just have to catch it on sale. You do. You have to be very. The only advice that I would give anybody when it comes down to these machines, you got to bargain with these people. You got to haggle with them. You got to threaten them. I'm going somewhere else or whatever it takes to get those prices down because they will bring the prices down. They tell you that's the manufacturer's suggested retail price. But that's not the price they have to sell it for. They will sell it for less. You walk in there and they slap that sticker on there and say $20,000. But that doesn't mean that you got to up to $20,000. If you refuse to pay $20,000 and you're heading out the door, they're going to come to you and say, look, wait, we can work this out. And you can get that price down. Because that's, that's just their suggested price that they're going to try to stick you with if you're willing to pay it. And Andrew, you said it depends on where you purchase and you know the uh, <laughs> the crooks where I live. <laughs> okay, Kristen said, I thought the Brother Stellar XE1 is $6,500. The XE1 is around $6,500. Okay, she corrected the, the XJ1. Now, is the J1 the one that is a combo? But even still, that shouldn't be $20,000. $20, if you can get it for $6,500, that, that's ridiculous. Because that's right up there with the Luminaire and the, and, and the um, Solaris. So somebody's really trying to, trying to um, okay, the XJ1 is 9000 Okay. All right. That's that's expensive, but that's a little bit better than that uh, twenty thousand dollars. But that still that that new Janome for twenty thousand that doesn't surprise me because I know when I saw the machine itself and what it does, then excuse me, 
when I saw the machine, he said it's on sale for eight. Andrea, what is that, a dollar? Going for nine thousand dollars, and now they got it on sale for eighty nine ninety nine, <laughs> maybe eleven thousand. Yeah, they have these little old ladies sitting at home with nothing else to do and a whole lot of money that'll go into these these stores, these dealerships, and they'll shell their money out and don't blink their eyes. And that's why they price it like that, because they know they can get the money from somebody. There's going to be somebody that's going in. I know um, we've taken some classes and they would have these, these um, I keep calling them little ladies because there I am, but <laughs> these elderly women, <laughs> would sit in there with their machines that cost a mint and they don't know how to how to turn the dog on thing on and they paid all that money for it and haven't even used it haven't even tried it don't know how to turn it on don't know how to do this that and the other with it but they saw it and they wanted it and, and the guy convinced them to buy it and they bought it so that's why they have those prices like that because they're going to always find customers that are willing to walk in there and pay what they what they um that's just like buying a car you go to a car dealership and they have the the manufacturer suggested retail price slapped up there on that car window and if you don't go in there and say uh -uh, i'm not paying that for this car then that's what you're going to pay if you go in there and you kind of push and pull with them, then they'll come down on the price. You shouldn't have to do that, but they will. Because I, I don't know what you guys paid for your brother, but I didn't pay that kind of money for mine. I'm just going to tell you, I did not pay. No, I did not pay $25 for my brother. Mm -mm. No way, Jose. Did not do that. Yeah, but the 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 Stellar is is still expensive. That's an expensive machine, but Andrew, I know you have one and you love yours, and it does a lot of things. So, I I I have to assume it's worth it. And you got a big hoop, and for me, that's the, one of the selling points with those kind of machines because they do come with larger hoop, which is kind of sad because as a single needle machine they give you this big huge hoop where you can sew all these beautiful intricate multi-colored designs but you have to constantly change your thread and here they sell a 10 needle machine made for you to change to not have to change thread and then they give you this look well i call it a little bit hoop because what is the hoop eight by 14 is that what it is Eight by 14, I think it is, which is seven and seven eighths by 13 and seven eighths, something along that line. You're sewing feel if you use their regular hoop that came with the machine, which I don't. I have the mighty hoop, so it's just a what is that, an eight by 13? And again, that's not the sewing feel, so you still with seven, seven eighths by 12 and seven eighths because it's eight by 13. It's eight by fourteen, so it's it's the same, I guess. The sewing feel that sounds like a lot, but when you're doing a jacket back or something like that, you quickly realize it's not a lot, not a lot of room. That's why I went on and got the jumbo hoop and um, learned how to use the jumbo hoop so I can make larger designs, and I would love to make them even larger than that. Okay, Yola Bean, you use Floriana and Madeira, but I've also used Gutterman on my single needle, no problem with any of them. Now, I hear Gutterman is a good thread. I've never used it, but it, 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 it's, an old, it's an old thread company, I think. I use Floriana, well, 
I'm transitioning to Florian because I think their colors are so vibrant and beautiful and I love them. They have so many different shades. If I had the money, I'd go in there and buy every color that they have because they're beautiful. So Floriani is my go-to thread. And um, but Madeira is good too. Madeira thread is good. And I've not used Gutterman. I've thought about it, but I just haven't haven't bought any Gutterman thread. And you also, have, Yola Bay, and you also have King Star. You just haven't used it yet. I think you're going to be happy with your King Star because I am. I use King Star three. Although I did get one, at least one. And you know, you can always get a bad batch. But I think I bought one color of King Star, and I had breakage with that, and I was mad. I was like, "Why is this breaking?" Because normally King Star does not break. But that particular color was breaking on me, and I'm go. I haven't tried it once. I'll try it again because it might have been my needle. I don't know. I did put a um, metallic needle in, but that doesn't mean it was a good needle. So I don't. I don't know what happened, but I know I had problems with it. Um, Tr, you're asking who was your dealer. And you said you want to upgrade. Who are you asking that question of? So that person can respond if they haven't already. My dealer is in Florida. Uh, <laughs> yes, Haggle for sure. Yep. My dealer, and it, I think it was a sewing bag in Tampa. I'm pretty sure that was it was a sewing bag in Tampa. And that was I bought my I bought my uh my machine February of 21. And it was a lady, cannot remember her name. But it was a sewing bag in Tampa, Florida, where I bought my machine. And I honestly did not have to haggle with her. She just didn't come up and give me that crazy price. When I walked in the store, I had talked to her on the phone. And I told her that I was shopping around. So that does that does help. And I, I was because I had an appointment with her because it was during the pandemic. So you had to make appointments. I had an appointment with her and I had an appointment with Avance, A-V-A-N-C-E, I believe it is, uh, that company. And um, I liked what I read about that machine, but I wasn't familiar with it. I had and I wanted to test it. So I had an appointment with the brother dealer on one day and the advanced dealer on the next day. And my son was uh, took me to, to the brothers that first day. And he was going to take me to, to the other place the next day. And the night before I went, I was online trying to do my due diligence and do my research. And look up the company and look up their reputation, look up um, a lot of stuff. And I think the advance is sold by Codesi, C-O-D-E-S-I, I think. And when I put in advance, Codesi came up. So I then started researching Codesi 
and I saw that they had an issue with the Better Business Bureau. And I said, mm -mm. nope, ain't going there. <laughs> I'm not getting in that. I'm not getting in that. I, I, nope, I, I'm not doing that. So I had pretty much in my head, and I was kind of disappointed because I had built myself up to want the advance. And that was because their their biggest hoop was 22 by 22 something. It was just huge. It was just, it was just huge. I know it was 22 by something. I think it was 22 by 20 or 22 by 22. But it was the largest hoop that I had seen, even larger than the um, Nelco. And but it was it was a commercial. It was a fifteen needle. And again, who's going to be your tech and all that kind of stuff? So when I saw that they had 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 a report to the Better Business Bureau. I just kind of said, I'm not, I'm not going. So when I went to the brother, I had pretty much made up my mind that that was where I was going to get my machine. I had spoken to her on the phone uh, a few days before I made my appointment and told her I was shopping around. And I think that had a lot to do with what price she decided to, to um, offer me because she knew that she wasn't the only, only uh, per, you know, her hat wasn't the only one in the ring, and it wasn't, because I was looking at the mail call, I was looking at the brother, and I was looking at the advance. The mail call was more than what I wanted to pay, and it was 16000 so that gives you a little idea about the brother. And I, um, the advance, if I'm not mistaken, might have been 12 or 13 because I pretty much told them how much money I had to spend uh, also and she was um, supposed to get back to me to see if she could work with that amount of money because I told her up front this is what I want to spend now which, what can you do and uh, pretty much told that same thing to, to the dealer brother dealer so when I got there she had already given me a, a, a price which was uh, below the Malco, and and um, I said, "Okay, got a deal here. You got a deal." But you know, and she and there was a nineteen thousand dollar sticker on on the machines. I, I just have to come up and, and be honest about it. There was a $19,999, some crazy amount of money sticker on the machine. But that figure never came out of her mouth because I would have turned around and walked out the store. As a matter of fact, I probably never would have gone in the store. But that, that price never came up. And people selling that machine for that kind of money, they that's that's just horrible. That really is. That's just like them selling that genomic for $19.99. That's horrible. That that machine, it's a good machine, but come on now. Mm -mm. The Luminaire. And again, like I said, when I went to get my machine, she told me that the Luminaire, because I asked her, was comparable to the price that they were selling the brother for. So it wasn't $19,000 either. That's not what they were going to sell it to me for. But again, that was in pandemic time. <laughs> that may have had a lot to do with it too. I don't know. It may have. It may have. Yeah. So you saying the same price for the PR 1050, 1050X was, are you saying it was 19,000, Andrea? Is that what you're saying? Because if anybody, if they still have a 1050X, I mean a 1050, I don't think it's 1050X, but if they still have a 1050, <clears throat> that machine should be considerably less because it is the one before the 1050X. So they be they should be selling it for less. 
money. That's just like the SE 1900. They're selling it for less than what they're selling. If I understand, they're selling it less than what they're selling the SC2000, which is the newer model. Now, the SC1900, when I bought it, it was under $1,000 when I bought it. And I got it off Amazon. And during the pandemic, it went up to $1,100. Eleven to twelve hundred dollars is what I kept seeing for the SC nineteen hundred everywhere I went because you couldn't get the eight the PE eight hundred you couldn't get the PE seven fifty you couldn't get any of those machines those machines were gone and the SC nineteen hundred was the only machine that I saw that was out there pretty much and they were selling them for eleven and twelve hundred dollars and like I said I didn't pay I didn't even pay a thousand for mine. Now I looked and the SC1900 is under a thousand. But then I also heard that the SC2000 is more. I think I heard someone say it's like $1,200. I'm not sure. So with the S, with that being said, the 1050 should be, Andrea is saying it's still 19,900 as of last Wednesday. Oh my goodness. A week ago. That's ridiculous. They should not be selling the 1050. Oh, you mean the 1055? I'm sorry. The 1055, they shouldn't be selling that for $20,000 either. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. But they will sell it if somebody will buy it. And I know that's what they're selling the baby lock for as well. And I, what is that baby lock name? If anybody knows, that's synonymous to the 1055 because I don't remember. I'm not a baby lock person. I've seen that machine. I don't know how many times because that's what the, the sewing vac that I go to is a baby lock dealer. So when I go in there and I talk machine, they, um, um, you know, they, they tell, you know, they do whatever they do on that baby lock machine that's just like the, the uh, brother, because the, the guy even told me they're just the same machine, you know, and he'll go in there and push buttons and show me this, show me that, and you can do this, that, and the other. So, but I can't remember what it is. Is it the Ventura? Something like that. I can't remember what it is. Okay, Crafty, you said you got your SC 1900 for 998 from Amazon two years ago, beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's pretty close to the price that they were selling it for. And um, yeah, I think that's what I paid for mine, close to that. I know it was less than a thousand, which is a couple of dollars, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, it might have been that. But I know, I know it wasn't eleven hundred and twelve hundred dollars. That much I know, and I know that they went up. And you said you got yours at the beginning of the pandemic, which I, which I got mine, because um, I got my brother February of twenty one, and I got my SC nineteen hundred, probably March. Of March of 20. That's probably when I got it. March, because it was it was just before the pandemic, before they said pandemic was here. And because I didn't buy it because of the pandemic and everybody was making masks and stuff, but that's ended what ended up happening. But that was not my purpose. I was buying it because I really wanted a embroidery machine. It had nothing to do with the pandemic and making masks and making money and stuff like that. It just happened to roll around at the same time but i think i bought mine in my like march of um 20 because it was right at the beginning and um and then i got my brother february of 21 and you said in february before the covid you paid 574 for the pe 800 and one month later it was 12 1200 at walmart yep 
it it just shot up and people were buying them like it was i mean you could not you got lucky because they went off the shelf you could not find a seven the 800 you couldn't find the 750 you couldn't find the 725 i think the 600 was still around for a little while but not long those machines just went like hotcakes because everybody was making masks and i know <laughs> I was I was in Walmart the other day to pick up something, and I always go by the fabric place, the little fabric area, and the lady was there, and we were chit chatting, and she was talking about back when we didn't have any material, and so and so so and so, and I said, so you all didn't have any material at all? She said, we didn't have any material, all, the, and I remember that in Florida, all the material was gone. You could not. I got lucky because when I started, uh, when I got my machine and I started making masks, I just started buying material. So I got plenty of material and I got a lot of fat quarters. And then I even went to Joanne and I would buy yardage because pe there were certain colors people liked. I got, I, I would always run out of black. So I started buying two and three yards of, of black uh, cotton fabric to make masks out of and what a, it was another color navy blue black and navy blue were the two colors that you know the rest of them i would get a half a yard or a quarter of a yard or something because i didn't need a lot of this color that color but when it came down to black and came down to blue i had to buy extra because i would go in there and they wouldn't have any they would run out of black fabric and i know walmart just went dry it went dry. You couldn't find any. You couldn't find a fat quarter. You couldn't find nothing. A roll, a boat, nothing. It was gone. And so um, that's what the lady said, that, you know, all the machines were gone. All of the fabric was gone. And people were just, you know, making masks by the dozen. Yeah. And stuff went up. And it went up on... on uh, if you didn't get lucky and get it while it was down, you weren't gonna make it. But I got lucky and like crafty, I got mine similar to you. I got my SC 1900 off of Amazon as well. And I think I paid right around that same amount of money. And it was just before the, the uh, before they start telling everybody they had to stay home. But because, and I'm pretty sure you were the same since you're a nurse, I was essential. <laughs> Cause I, I didn't miss a beat. <laughs> I wanted to stay home, and I wasn't doing patient care. I was not doing patient care, and we still had to go in. And I know one of the masks that I made, cause I was so doggone mad. I had essential. I stitched essential <laughs> on my mask, cause I was, I was so mad. I said, obviously, I am essential. I have to be. <laughs> Because I did not want to go in. Because I did work in a hospital setting. I just didn't do patient care. And I didn't want to be in the hospital because we had COVID people coming up in there. And I, look, I'm, I'm high risk. And I told them, I'm, I'm high risk. My age and my, my health, I'm high risk. I don't want to be here. They didn't care. You got you to come in. And the work that I was doing, I could do at home. But they didn't care. I had to go in. I was essential. So I'm sure, Crafty, you were essential as well, being a nurse. They didn't let us let us be at home. If we had nurse behind our names, <laughs> we had to go in. <laughs> we had to go in. Yeah, that was that was that was something else. That dog on pandemic. My word from heaven. <sighs> but I for me, the only thing that really meant pandemic to me was the fact that you wore masks everywhere. Other than that, nothing for me changed because I didn't go out a lot anyway, out to eat and all that. So we did go a little bit, not that much. That part wasn't a big deal, but everything stayed the same for me because I, I, I went to work every day. I didn't miss a beat. I went to work every day. So a lot of people, you know, had all these issues and complaints and ooh, ooh and on and all that stuff. It was the same to me. Nothing changed. 
<laughs> I'm like the poor people in the grocery stores and the gas stations and all the other places that were essential. They didn't go home. <laughs> okay, Crap, you said John Hopkins. We knew about it and started getting ready before it got to the U.S. I worked on the COVID floor from the beginning. Oh, my goodness. Well, bless your heart. Are you, did you work in ICU or did or did they turn the, the COVID floor was ICU? And you worked in that COVID. Oh, girl, bless your heart, honey. Bless your heart. But I'm gonna tell you what I told told my my uh, my coworkers, and and I would have said this to my boss had he been crazy enough to tell us we had to go to the back. Because we were in our office, we worked in the office. We were we worked in admission, so we brought people in and uh, worked with the doctors and, and the um, discharge planners and social workers and so forth in the various hospitals. And we were bringing people into our rehab hospital because I worked in the rehab hospital, and so I worked in the office. And they were, you know, if there had been talk of having the nurses go help out in the back that was not going to be me because I said I started my nursing career doing the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and I worked through that and took care of AIDS patients and worked up on the floor with AIDS patients and bone marrow transplant patients and everybody so sick as a dog patient and we had a lot of sick pay oncology we had a lot of people come in there that had signs and symptoms of AIDS, but AIDS had not been identified at the time. We were taking care of them until, you know, a few few um, months later. And then we kind of pulled the clock back and said, we probably took care of these AIDS patients and we didn't know it and we weren't protected. And I went through that. And I said, I've already been through one crisis. I'm not working with COVID because I got, I had my, my health threat with the AIDS epidemic, I'm not doing it twice. Cause I know we were, we were scared. We had to take care of AIDS. We did take care of AIDS patients that we knew were AIDS patients. And I'm not talking about HIV. I'm talking about full blown AIDS patients. And um, I was scared. Cause at that time we didn't know what, just like with the pandemic, people didn't know. We didn't know exactly what to do. They told us, you know, bleach kills it and it can't live outside the body for a certain period of time. And, 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 you know, you have to have open wounds and this, that, and the other, but people, and they didn't have the safeguards on the needles like they do now. And people were do, getting needle pricks like I did and all kinds of stuff that was going on. And <clears throat> the fear of having uh, contracted HIV and AIDS was very high. But, you know, being a nurse, you got to do what you got to do. And that's what we did. Now, I work with drug rehab and detox. I never missed a day, but I was fortunate enough to be management and went in to give support to my staff. Well, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's good that you didn't have to do hands on. It did, but you, you helped out, you know, you do what you have to do. I, I, I worked in management as well. And, and definitely had to give support to my staff, but that was before the pandemic. <laughs> when the pandemic hit, I wasn't in management anymore. I was in, I was in a totally different work environment. I, that was in Virginia when I was in management. When I went to Florida, I was in the office, uh, in admission office, and it was like, mm -mm, I'm not going back there. I'm not taking care of no AIDS, no uh, COVID patient. I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. Um, a lot of the patients had COVID, yeah. And Crafty, I turned the clinical decision unit where I worked into a COVID floor as well as the ICU, and the rest of the hospital was closed. Oh, okay. So all you had was um, COVID. Oh, Lord. Yeah, that was. Good night, everyone. Join the rest of your enjoy the rest of your weekend. It ain't weekend, girl. You must be tired and sleeping. <laughs> it's Tuesday. <laughs> anyway, good night. <laughs>
But yeah, well, it is getting late. We always kind of forget about the time frame and stuff here. We've had a good little chat about some of everything in the world. And um, once um, <clears throat> Yola Bean told me to <laughs> turn my sound off on my computer, everything worked well. So I guess I will um, keep using the <laughs> keep using the uh, the stream or the stream yard because that worked okay. Bad. We also had had a floor. All of our clients came straight off the street. Yeah. <clears throat> That A stuff was something. It was definitely something. Because I had worked in oncology. And we were getting patients in there that had some of the same signs and symptoms and, and everything of an AIDS patient. And we didn't know what AIDS was at the time until we learned. I learned that from the radio stuff. You know what? You are right, uh, Yola Bean. I remember when they would tell people to turn your sound off, turn, turn, mute your, mute your radio and do that. It never dawned on me, but you're right. So now I know why they tell people to do that. Okay. So I'll remember that one. Crafty, I, it was like being in the war. A lot of losses weekly. I, yes. Yes. It was so many people dying. Yes. And I, I don't know if you, I guess you are a floor nurse. I, I was a floor nurse. When I worked in the hospital, I was always a floor nurse. I never went into management when I worked in the hospital. And like I said, I worked on oncology. And we had people that potentially had AIDS. And I, I can remember going to work one morning and I was getting a report because that was back then when you actually went and sat down somewhere and got report from the people and did you walk through and all that stuff. <clears throat> I think I had three patients that died before I even knew who the patients were. I hadn't even gotten report. It just happened to be my team. And here comes the A or the LPN telling me so-and-so, so-and-so died, and this person died, and that person died. And I didn't even know who these people were. People were just, I mean, and this is in, on one shift early in the morning before I even got out, out of a uh, out of report. So I can imagine it was way worse than that with what you were, were experiencing, Crafty. Because that the what we saw on the news was enough. It was enough. It was enough. It was scary and it was sad. Yes, I work on the floor. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Yep. Well, I know you say you do 12 hours, so I know you're working hard, girl. I know you are doing that flow and doing 12 hours. I never did 12 hours. I did 10. I wasn't going to do that 12. But you might as well, because when you work 10, you still end up putting in 11 hours because it took you another hour to get, to get done with everything. So you go home. <laughs> so might as well. Might as well. <laughs> done 12. Because I know... That, yeah, Lord, I'm so glad to get up out of working in a hospital on the floor. That just was not for me. Well, everybody, it is getting late. It is 10 minutes to 10. We've had a wonderful conversation. Everybody has uh, pitched in, told all their little stories, asked all their questions and stuff. And I think that... Um, <clears throat> We need to wrap it up now and, um, you know, see you next Tuesday. I'm Nobody gave me a name, so I don't know what I'm going to call, call this live, but I'll have to try to think of something to see what, what we can call the live. Some little cute, catchy name, like Crafty, the, the Crafty Puerto Rican. And I mean, I've seen so many cute little names. This is another girl got got a name that doesn't pertain to her her own personal name. I know a lot of people have um, names of their their uh, their lives based around their own personal name, and I don't want to do that. But I want to come up with something cute and catchy. So I guess I have to uh, to uh, 
get my brain working. Good night and have a great week. You too, Val. Yola Bean, good night, everyone. See you next week. <laughs> and Crafty, I'm planning to go PRN soon so that I can get more flexible in my schedule. Yeah, do that PRN if you can. If you can do that PRN, do it. That's a good idea. But okay, good night, everybody. I'm going to sign off and I will talk to all of you later. Take care. Stay safe and have a great week. Bye.